Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Brian Whedon, um, and in the context of this, I'm serving two hats today. I'm both the Director of Program Planning at Skirball Foundation and also the Executive Director of CONFERS. As Jeremy Shield mentioned earlier, CONFERS is a DARPA-funded consortium of satellite servicing companies to develop the best practices and technical standards that will improve the viability of commercial satellite servicing. Uh, CONFERS has been in operation for about three years now uh, and has over 40 members from several countries including the US, Japan, Canada, Germany, and France. Through CONFERS, we've been working with our members and subject matter experts from multiple governments to develop recommended practices and potential standards that will help make commercial satellite servicing a safe, effective, and sustainable industry. So over the course of today's program, you've heard about some of the key technologies, business opportunities, the importance of standards, and the policy and regulatory challenges that we're currently working on in the satellite servicing world. There are lots of open questions and challenges uh, that the sector is still working on, but also a huge amount of promise. So what does that future look like for us in the satellite servicing world? I think the future for commercialized servicing is pretty bright, and I think we're set to see a lot of movement over the next few years. We're seeing a concerted effort by governments such as the NASA OSAM program uh, that Ben Reed talked about earlier and DARPA's backing of CONFERS to help lay some of the technical and standards foundations that will enable the satellite servicing industry. And it's not happening just here in the US. You also saw from charity discussion of what's happening in Europe with Paraspora and the European operations framework and also Japan's strong policy focus uh, on backing some of their satellite servicing and removal activities. We're seeing governments start to think about including commercial satellite servicing as an element of their future space architectures uh, and, and including commercial services um, in things such as gateway and future uh, human spaceflight and also robotic operations. That can help serve as an important cor cornerstone customer uh, to help get the industry off the ground. In addition to governments, we're seeing a growing number of satellite operators and companies um, that are uh, looking and exploring, looking at and exploring using commercial servicing to help improve their businesses. And lots of other companies, uh, many of whom are CONFERS members, that are successfully raising capital, booking both government and non-government customers, and starting to do demonstrations on orbit, as we saw earlier this year with the really successful demonstration of space logistics in the ability to dock with and reposition a satellite in the geosynchronous region. So at the end of the day, what does all this mean? Well, if we can make it viable to refuel, repair, inspect, move, assemble, deorbit satellites, that opens up a whole new world of possibilities for human space activities. Ben Reed mentioned one example, which is assembling massive telescopes that could never be launched from Earth in order to help study extrasolar planets. Another is to remove existing orbital debris that poses a potential threat to everything we do in space. And there's probably many more potential applications and benefits that we just haven't conceived of yet uh, that will come along as we start exploring these technologies. So with that, I will wrap things up. Um, and I'll turn it over to Lauren Grush, who is going to be moderating our live Q&A session. Hello, thank you so much, Brian. And thank you so much for joining me for this Q&A. I'm honored to moderate what should be a really great discussion about this emerging commercial industry. Also, you, we all just finished listening to a really stellar lineup of speakers who broke down every bit of on-orbit on servicing you could want from use cases, business cases, and the long history of this concept. So I'm gonna get things started with a question of my own, and then I'm going to ask some of the questions that y'all have submitted through the Q&A feature. So I wanna to touch on viability, which Brian was just mentioning. So from my point of view, the level of complexity required to create a satellite servicer, say in the vein of OSIM-1, for instance, with robotic arms and sensors for delicate rendezvous and proximity operations, seems much more work intensive than creating the actual satellites in need of fixing them in the first place. So I'm curious what needs to be done to make this viable, to make servicing affordable for a customer, 
and ensure that the servicer is actually making a profit. You know, does the cost of launch need to come down? Is there a certain amount of time these satellites need to remain in orbit or a number of satellites that they have to service in order to be cost effective? Really curious to know what are the biggest factors in your opinion to make this cost effective? Lauren, should we just jump in? Yeah, I, that is directed at the whole group. So go on well, in. Uh, what a pleasure to be here. <clears throat> I think there are two really important ways to frame that question. The first is sort of the direct question you've asked and uh, simplicity, um, uh, a focus on customer needs and um, a, a, a reasonable level of operational cost are all critical to, to viability. And so MEV, for example, uses a relatively straightforward technology, does not require satellites to be designed specifically to accommodate it, and has demonstrated that there is a market for its services. I do think that there's another way to frame the question that's really important in thinking about future viability, and that is systemically. So um, if I'm thinking about a long-term exploration architecture or advanced concepts that I want to implement, the market today for an advanced servicing capability may be small, but the, what it enables in order for me to achieve my goals over the long term may be significant. So I think that's really an important part of thinking about advanced servicing concepts. Anyone want to jump in on that answer as well? Sure. Yeah, this is, uh, this is Ben. So I agree with you 100%. The OSAM-1 vehicle is a sophisticated, uh, many, many technology uh, uh, required uh, vehicle to, uh, to do what it's going to do. But that was partly by design. We intentionally chose a legacy client. We intentionally chose a challenging task, uh, and that is refueling of that legacy client, as well as relocation, as well as assembly and manufacturing. Um, part of NASA's job is to do the hard things, develop technology, transfer it to industry, and let them do what they do best and produce it at, at a low cost and generate a competitive market. Um, as uh, uh, Carissa said, uh, if you have uh, long-term visions, uh, architectures you're establishing, um, investing early to allow those uh, architectures to work more efficiently um, is, is a worthwhile investment. So it was very deliberate, uh, the mission we chose to, to go after, and we applaud Northrop Grumman for what they did uh, with, uh, with MEV, and we look forward to MEV2 and, and all the others uh, from, from them and their competitors um, to, to continue to do um, the, uh, the less risky missions while the government uh, does its job and tackles uh, the really tough things. Hey, Lauren, I'll give you a bit of a, maybe a policy answer to that as well. I see two things that need to happen. Uh, there needs to be a desire to set up an in-space logistical ecosystem like we have here on Earth. We have airports, we have we even have spaceports yeah, here on Earth. And, and that logistics chain is what, um, accelerates the ability to do these things in space. And servicing is one of, one of those parts of that logistics chain. Also, satellite operators need to learn um, that this is a new orbital environment. It's congested. Uh, we're going to have to rethink how we use the orbital environment and how we're behaving in that orbital environment so as to minimize the risk of debris. And that's where servicing comes in as well. Great. Um, now I have a question that was submitted to the chat from some anonymous uh, submitter. So what are the opportunities for servicing in LEO? We talked a lot about the economic cases for GEO, but it seems like a, a big future of satellite of the satellite industry are these large constellation, constellations. So what is the market size and what do you envision being the biggest way that satellite sor servicing is used in terms of these um, huge constellations that are being proposed? I don't mind if I take this one uh, first, Lauren. Um, by the way, for those that don't know Astroscale, we were founded in 2013 to develop innovative and scalable solutions across the spectrum of on-orbit servicing, which includes life extension, in-situ SSA, end-of-life services, and active debris removal in multiple orbits. So LEO and GEO and 
everywhere in between at this point. So we're also, you know, defining that business case and working with government and commercial stakeholders to develop those norms, regulations, and incentives for the responsible use of space. And we have a demo later on this year uh, in Lower Thorbid to showcase how to um, uh, rendezvous, uh, collect a piece of uh, space junk, quote unquote, and then dispose of it safely. Uh, so stay tuned for that. But for servicing in Leo, yeah, you know, you're right that the business case needs to close, especially with those smaller and less expensive satellites. However, two things are important here. One, there still remains high value satellites in Leo. Uh, for example, Worldview 4 last year had a fine guidance system anomaly. Um, and two, Leo is congested, as I said before, and investors are pouring in billions of dollars to build out large constellations. And this is where end of life and disposal services are uniquely suited to ensure that continuity of operations for these large constellations. And no one wants Leo to become one big debris field. So active debris removal and end of life services will be an important tool to ma maintain that orbital safety in Leo. So if I can jump in after Charity, obviously agree with everything Charity said. Just sticking with my sort of R1, R2, R6 uh, uh, paradigm, that uh, the taxonomy. So uh, Leo is 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 ripe for R1 remote survey. We do want to understand, um, you know, if there's if there are challenges or anomalies, how you know how we might better understand them. There's also, I mean, depending on how you define remote survey, I mean, is you know is is space based SSA part of uh, the the system as well. So um, uh, for R2, uh, I think Char uh, uh, Charity already mentioned there's a lot of deorbiting services that may be required for uh, in Leo. Um, R3, R4, refueling, repair, R5, replace parts. Those are more for geo or uh, other other space regimes where um, you know where lifetime of satellites is, is much more important than in, in LEO, although depending on some high value government, civilian or military satellites, there may be a rationale for those as well. Um, uh, and R6 is a little bit of a question, recharging. But there's, I mean, I, 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 what I'm trying to say is that, you know, there is, there are lots of opportunities for uh, on our orbit servicing services in, in LEO. And the key there, as I think Carissa said, is customers, you know, who would want to have these services. It, I, I would like to add, great, great answer, Bavia. Um, I would like to, to add to the conversation, planning for servicing. So next time you walk to the front door of your house, you can get in through it two different ways, with the doorknob, or you could get a screwdriver and a hammer and go through the hinge side and take the door off. Now, which is quicker? Probably the doorknob because it was prepared for somebody about your height with a hand about the size of yours. So if we start making satellites with cooperative features, it'll be like so easy, a robot can do it. Not so difficult, it takes an unbelievably sophisticated amount of NASA technology to get it done. So as we think about the future, let's think about preparing them. That's why in my charts, I showed the servicing spectrum. There's probably 20 or 30 items on that list of things that satellite manufacturers can do to add to their satellite to make them more like a door knob, not a hinge. And, and one other thing to add to that, um, you know, some uses for LEO, especially when you have servicing capabilities like refueling, um, opens up kind of a new paradigm of uh, business models. So for instance, you could take your earth observation satellites and take them down from your 500 to 750 kilometers and bring them all the way down to 350 kilometers and get four times your image resolution. Uh, but in order to do that, you know, you're constantly burning your propellant. So you would come back up and refuel and go back down. Now, additionally, you know, we, we have advancements in satellite technology every few years. And so you have these spacecraft that are in LEO or um, that, you know, they're getting older, but the tech is still good. And you have different markets around the world that are coming online. So while you have your new technology being launched and your new spacecraft, instead of uh, junking your old generation satellites, you know, that still might be good. Um, you, could, you could change its orbit with, you know, a tug or a fueling or what have you, and now address a newer market um, for the remainder of its life. 
So there are just a lot of things that, you know, until the infrastructure is put in place, we're, we're not even thinking um, of, of the business models that are even possible. I mean, if you, if you go back 50 years, you know, or 100 years and you say, hey, there's going to be a company that can deliver a package to you anywhere on earth in two days, uh, people would look at you like you're crazy. Um, and it's, and that's why this part is so important is as we lay these building blocks, you know, who knows what kind of businesses are going to come online because of the servicing industry. Great. I want to add on to that. We touched on this during some of those answers, but the, the idea of active debris removal, that's one of our next questions. So, uh, Carson Bullock asked, um, you know, can anyone speak further to the relationship between on orbit servicing and active debris removal? Kept separate, kept separate is active debris removal a subset of on orbit servicing or more like a Venn diagram? And I, I want to add on to that. Do we see active debris removal being perhaps one of the most important parts of on orbit, orbit servicing technologies moving forward? So I could I could go first and um, again uh, I think I mean this was a taxonomy that was developed at NASA and I really think it might be worthwhile for us to stick with it. So active debris removal in the taxonomy is part of R two relocate. Uh, you know it could be uh, you know there's many different ways of debris removal right. You could be removing um, you know d you know rocket bodies or debris and geo or or leo. In one case, you're bringing it down to Earth. In the other case, you're moving as a graveyard orbit. So on-orbit services is this, is this basket of goods or activities under which there are all these different things you can do, like you know, take close-up pictures, do active debris removal, um, you know, replace parts, refuel, recharge, and all of that. So I don't know if this is helpful uh, as a taxonomy to kind of place various things. Uh, and I and I wonder if any of the other panelists have thoughts on that. I uh, I'd, I'd like to add to um, uh, uh, that valuable structure. <clears throat> there are two really different economic constructs for debris removal. If you think about debris that exists that may have unclear ownership, um, <clears throat> uh, that uh, where, where there may be issues over whose, res whose responsibility is, that is, a, that is a very sort of typical pollution problem. It's hard to find a payer to remove shared pollution, the responsibility for which you cannot specifically allocate and um, the need for which you cannot compel. So we as a community have a hard problem in addressing existing debris. There's quite a separate economic construct associated with preventing um, or uh, debris going forward where it's very clear who's conducting the, the deployment. It's very clear what the rules are around ensuring that we're not creating additional problems and programs like CONFERS, programs like the World Economic Forum Space Sustainability Rating, national regulations, all will help us drive to matching responsibility and um, uh, fi financial support of de debris mitigation, separate from issues of technology. Um, if I might add, Lauren, I wanted to state that, you know, we feel active debris removal is a subset, so um, not necessarily a Venn diagram, because when you break it down to the key technologies, the first thing you look at is what, it, what do all these missions have in common? They approach another object in space, right? To inspect it, to grapple it, to tinker with it. And so that rendezvous is kind of a common picture, a common um, thread throughout all servicing activities. Essentially, confers as the consortium for the execution of rendezvous and servicing. And so that's where we're kind of all coalescing under that roof. Um, as far as is it the most important uh, servicing mission, you know, these are all really important. They're all going to be in, um, uh, in pivotal roles as, as we want to expand outward um, from this planet and explore cislunar space and other, and other um, uh, orbits. Um, I think debris is our number one issue in face of us in the next five years. Um, and I really encourage to see 
the uh, uptake of and the ability to conduct servicing missions, first in GEO, but there will probably be other servicing missions also for the, you know, the gateway um, project as well. And you can see that in the five to 10 year framework. Also, I think as a charity you said earlier, I mean, if we're talking about a space-based logistics infrastructure, all of these services fit in at different timelines, at different stages. So as we, as you know, you just said, if we go out to the lunar space or, or to Mars, I mean, there's, there may be a lot of need for having propellant depots and you know, refueling services. Uh, in the near term, as you said, uh, debris, orbital uh, debris removal is a, is a critical need. So I, I don't think it's, uh, I think we need to maybe make progress on some areas uh, earlier than, than, than others, but we need to move out. And again, as you said, technology developments in one area do help others, uh, you know, whether it's computer vision, robotics, automation, they can apply across the board to multiple areas of services. Frank, you're, mood, you're muted. Uh, Frank, you're on mute. mute. You can uh, hold Alt A on your keyboard to unmute Frank. It's in the lower left hand corner of the screen. Uh, is that unmute myself? Good. I just clicked on it. All right, yep. now, can you hear me? Yes? I'm clear. Yep. I can hear you. Okay. Look, I think the, 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 um, one of the problems that I'm seeing is that, uh, that, it, that this is all of these activities, legal, commercial, NASA, defense, and so on, that, that the cart's getting away from us. The horses are out of the barn. There are, there are at least two or 300 commercial communication satellites in low Earth orbit already. And there's more going up. And just the other day, there was 56 more satellites launched by SpaceX. So my perspective is that this issue of orbital debris relative to retrieving satellites and so on becomes an economic trade-off. And what these satellite owners are saying is, oh, we'll take the last 10 pounds of fuel and we'll save that fuel for deorbiting our satellites when their two-year, three-year, or five-year missions are over. So they're basically saying, basically saying, stay out of our ball camp. We are going to make those economic decisions ourselves as to how to do it. And, you know, I found 40 years ago when we were doing satellite servicing on Solar Max and on and trying to get Hubble underway and trying to get these technologies rolling. The only way we could, the only chance we had to advance the concept with customers is to basically offer up already developed interfaces that they could very cheaply incorporate into their systems to make their satellites capturable make them serviceable. And so we have to do that. And I think that Ben Reed's point about the um, refueling um, um, interface, if you can have standard and offer up standard refueling interfaces that are standard, maybe two or three different standards, but have them available, that's where the only way we're gonna make any headway in terms of trying to incorporate servicing in these future systems. Because otherwise, I'll tell you now, because of cost reasons, the commercial as well as the government systems are saying it costs too much to make them serviceable. We're going to basically fly away, use them, use that capital asset for 5, 10, 15 years, and then, and then debunk them. And that's the end of it. And that's exactly the same thing you're seeing now happening with NASA satellites. You know, I ask you how fast they're walking away from W first satellite in terms of being serviceable, which is now called Roman satellite, um, just because of fear of cost growth. I saw the same fear of cost growth come into play with GROW. I saw it come into play with uh, five Hubble servicing missions, a Hubble, uh, the Hubble design to begin with. And until you can offer up standard components that have already been developed and already been flown, could you ever turn the market around? and? What we're dealing with now is not a question of influencing the market, but in fact, turning the market around. And we've got to come to realization of that. 
the market isn't going to fall in our laps. The market has to be turned around by virtue of being able to demonstrate that you can have standard interfaces that they can incorporate very cheaply into their systems and reduce the cost of their development. And uh, the this goes on and on. This goes even to grapple, very simple grapple fixtures to put on. Uh, so it, it's a very difficult problem, but we're not going to solve it by trying to write regulations, by influencing laws. There will always be smart lawyers and smart people that can read around the laws and do their own systems and it goes their own way. What's going to drive the market is cost. And cost is a function of development and pre-development. And that's where we're going to win. Otherwise, I think it's going to be a hopeless situation. I hate to be that pessimistic, but so far in confers and in the legal aspects, all I can read into that is a further and further fear that our potential future customers are going to be driven further and further away from either considering servicing. So we got to deal with that issue. We got to deal with standardization. We got to deal with small standardizations. We got to deal with costs. We got to deal with developing example, example after example, and perhaps a universal robot servicer that can do things for many different satellites and many different configurations without them having to be, without individual companies having to be held to a specific set of specs or requirements. That's it. Well, great. On that note, let's, I want to talk about standards um, and what you think the trend is to, uh, towards what the best kind of grappling fixture is. And then on another note from an, um, Stephen Kieran, he wants to know what the most prudent method to dock with an already orbiting satellite that has not been designed with uh, in-orbit servicing in mind. So that's a twofold question. What are some of the best trends for, and standards for you know adjusting your satellite before going up so that it can be serviced and then how do we deal with the satellites that haven't been serviced and what's the best way to deal with those the last part of your question satellites that were not designed to be serviced or that would could take advantage of a uh, fixture of a uh, standard system ben reed can answer that question as far as standard grappling and non-standard grappling and does it have to be a standard so there's that piece of the question the first question you asked had to do with, can you repeat it again one more time? What are the trends in standardization that you are seeing in terms of what's the best fixture to put on a satellite? I know that plates have been discussed, especially with AstroScale. I'm wondering if there are other trends that you are seeing about ways that satellites can be outfitted um, that are cheap and that are easy to do um, that you think that everything okay, I got it. I got it. First, we need a very lightweight, cheap, small grappling fixture to put on any of these low cost, low weight, low earth orbit communication satellites. So within an, within a question of a pound, we can, with any kind of robot arm, go up and grab that satellite no matter where it is. So that's number one, and it has to be. And the same thing with refueling. Many of these satellite builders and operators are going to get encouraged by the success rate of these satellites and they're going to be disappointed at the fact that they're only getting two or three years worth of life because they're running out of fuel. So you have to put in very small standard refueling devices that again, a robot can run up there, capture the satellite and refuel it. And, and Ben described a couple of them. There's two or three in the market. And we've got to allow companies to, that are component builders to bid those kinds of things. And we've got to open up the component market so that, in fact, eventually the component market will drive the cost of the total satellites down to a very low number. Now, I bring this up as a good example because Landsat 4, Landsat 5, um, Grow, um, and the four Hubble servicing missions and uh, Westar and Palapa, they all use standards. They picked up standards and they didn't pick it up because it came to ask the government for it. They picked it up because it was the cheap, smartest thing they could do for the money they had to spend for those satellites. And so if you take a look, 
out of 98 some odd components for Hubble Space Telescope, and we did not have control of Hubble Space Telescope in those days. Lucky did. But if you look at that, about 40 of those components were standard. And they were standard because that was the most capable piece of hardware they could buy for the least amount of money. And that made the, that made the whole picture fall together so that you could, in fact, work your way around through servicing, even though you may not have ever planned for it. So having the plan for it is only one piece of the equation. Having the standards to take care of it is a certainly that are economically affordable and that are non-dictated are certainly the other op option that you have to convince these builders to take advantage of capability, expanding capability. And you can't do it by dictating. You can't do it by directing. You got to do it by economics. Yep, and just, just to add on to that, um, you know, at Orbifab, we've worked and have developed a, a small fueling port that can actually be used all the way down to a six unit CubeSat. And it fits in the tuna can volume of the deployer. And, and it's as cheap as a traditional filled drain valve that you would currently buy on the market anyways. And yeah, and we're seeing um, even, you know, adoption in the U.S. Air Force. Like we're now under contract in a phase two to fully flight qualify this, you know, before the end of next year so they can start flying it on, on their missions. Right. The goal and, and, and it wasn't just orbit fab that, you know, sat in a room, you know, and we kept all the doors closed and we just designed the thing. We went out and we talked and, and interviewed 25 or actually maybe even more than 30 commercial companies and a few government agencies gathering their requirements on what they wanted. Um, and, and I firmly believe that, you know, a government shouldn't set a standard right off the bat uh, because they're not going to be as cost sensitive as the commercial market, like as you're saying. Exactly. You hit it right on the head. In fact, you drive the customer away when you start talking about setting standards. That's the last yes. thing they want to hear about. What they want to hear about is cost, cost, and, and speed yes. of integration yep. and test and delivery. Yeah. So, so I can I can jump in here a little bit maybe. Um, so if you, you ask what's the best grapple fixture to, to put on a satellite, well, I think we're all in agreement. Do something, don't do nothing. Because there are competitors now, as Jeremy has pointed out, and there's others be, uh, beyond his company, um, there's no excuse to do nothing. Um, every satellite should have something put on the back. Um, earlier this year, uh, we took action uh, to this end. We, uh, NASA Goddard, and we released uh, a, a, uh, an RFP for companies to respond with their grapple fixtures. We are going to be evaluating them later this year in the lab to determine what are the, the pros and cons of each of these commercial grapple fixtures. There's no need for the government to develop a small lightweight grapple fixture if commercial industry has already done it. So we are, have an active program right now. We're going to have a press release on this in a, in a, in a week or two um, as to uh, which companies we have Space Act agreements with to, uh, uh, to determine what are the pros and cons of each one of these grapple fixtures. The government has one this big that's up on ISS right now. But I don't think we want to put one this big on satellites that are smaller than my, my computer table. Um, and that is why there's a market now for these smaller grapple fixtures. So uh, the question was, what's the best one? It depends on who the client is, and it depends on the cost of the product. So uh, thank you, commercial industry, for a competitive market. And I'll just add that, you know, there, you're right, Ben. These grapple fixtures are emerging from the commercial entities. Um, they're lightweight, they're inexpensive, and so there's a great opportunity here um, to test those out and just get them on your satellite because it's too late when it launches. Right. I mean, yeah. if, if, yeah. if, if anything, like, I would say there should be a, a requirement like that a satellite, uh, a satellite operator or uh, integrator puts on either a fueling port or a docking plate and in turn, they get a discount on their insurance. Some, some, some metric to incentivize them to fly these because, uh, I mean, a docking plate or a fill drain valve, it's not as uh, invasive, you know, as, as regretting it and uh, doing something in the future, like a restore out. I said those exact words to uh, a space insurance company um, earlier this year at Satellite 2020. 
And the response was, we're not going to give a discount to anybody for putting them on. We're going to penalize the satellites that don't have them on. And I said, peace. Yes, perfect. It's good to hear. World Economic Forum also has uh, an ongoing space sustainability rating uh, effort. And uh, I'm not sure where they are in the, in the finalizing that rating, but it's also another incentive, like those carrots out there that operators can go for, get that AAA rating from the SSR. I have a docking plate. I have all these plans for disposal after end of life. And so that, that's a you know, corporate social responsibility kind of uh, angle to this uh, issue as well, other than just you know, fines and penalties. Okay, I, yeah, but I think you bring up another very good point. What vehicles are you going to use to do those capturing and refueling and repairing and junk removal systems? Where are those vehicles and how standard are they and how cheap are they? Because that's another very important cost factor that enters in. And one of the other cost factors is what are orbit are they going to be parked at at LEO? I'm not worried about so much parking at GEO, but at LEO, where are you going to park them? What inclination? And how are you going to capture the market? And who's going to pay for them? Those are very, very big cost-effective factors. And unless the community comes along and says, hey, we're going to have these little teeny sand, standard refueling satellites and we're going to park them here, here, and here, you're not going to have the basis by which you can take care of orbital debris or space repair or refueling or whatever at LEO, especially at LEO. So that's the other aspect that I haven't heard anybody talk about is where are your standard, multiple configurable, flexible servicers that can take care of five or six or seven different configurations in one shot, that is in one location in orbit. Well, that leads me, I have a follow-up question from the discussion that we just had, which is you talked about it's better to have something, better to have a grapple fixture over nothing. But I'm curious, you know, how important is having a universal grapple fixture? For instance, on the International Space Station, we have that universal docking adapter that has that one standard so that multiple vehicles can design their docking system around that. If we have different types of grappling fixtures attached to multiple different satellites, is that going to make it harder for the industry to develop their systems if we have all these different types of grapple fixtures available? Uh, I'll take this one to start. Um, the, the ISS docking fixture is great, but they also have a ton of money and engineers and time to develop it. And if you put a standard, like you must fly this docking plate uh, or this grapple fixture, you really lose out on that innovation. Um, and, and now you're not actually sure if you even have the best solution. Uh, you know, it's in, important that we do have standards later on, um, but the market should really decide what the plate is because the it's always going to be a competition on cost and performance and whoever can deliver the best of both of those things will be will end up being the standard because everyone's going to flock to them. That's so, right. But you, That's a good point. Yeah, go and it comes right down to how flexible is your servicer going to be, your servicing vehicle. Is it going to be flexible enough to carry to be able to handle three or four different systems? Is it gonna have artificial intelligence on board so it can sense these things and then make the appropriate adjustments for the grappling? All these questions come into play, but that then turns the interface back to standard servicing systems. What are those systems gonna be? Who's gonna provide them? Is the fleet operator that's gonna launch 2,000 of these birds in LEO are they going to be responsible for providing their own systems? They could very well be. And they may come forward and say, we'll take care of it. Don't worry about it. It's our problem. We'll take care of it. And that, that could be the answer. And that would also get back to this question of, um, of, of a lot of the legal application, uh, implications and sorted, sorted with SpaceX. But I'll tell you what, SpaceX or OneWeb, and they call themselves something else now, they're, they're not really going head on and try to solve the legal problems. They're trying to basically solve the logistical problems of how to get rid of their debris when their satellites are over, and that's it. Okay, great. 
Um, let's move on. I have another question that I came up with earlier. Um, and maybe this would be best for Carissa. You talked earlier about the government, how the government still very much drives a lot of space exploration is a big source of funding. And obviously something that NASA is very concerned with right now is sending the first woman to the moon for the Artemis program. I wanna know, do you see a business case there for using these satellite serving technologies to help with these long-term ambitious human space exploration missions? And in what ways could they enable more complex deep space missions or human spaceflight initiatives? Lauren, uh, as, I, as I spoke about before, uh, the fact that government is the ultimate payer does not mean that there's not a robust commercial market. There's providing services directly to government uh, it, through increasingly innovative mechanisms. There's shared, there's shared activities and um, uh, joint almost joint missions, certainly um, shared development and innovation. The question of how servicing plays in there, I think really is, um, it, 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 it's a very expansive answer depending on how you define servicing. So when I spoke, I took some liberties um, with, uh, and, and, and sort of expanded the view of servicing out through on-orbit assembly and manufacturing because re really it's the ability to conduct operations in space, uh, uh, typically robotically, um, uh, in a variety of, of uh, in a variety of areas. <clears throat> Thinking about exploration specifically, there's one really interesting area is enabling long-term sustainable presence. And so if I'm going to do two or three flights, it maybe is not worth the investment in advanced servicing capabilities or an in-situ resource utilization system. If I'm envisioning an ongoing presence on the surface of the moon, the economics change dramatically. And so there, a wide variety of servicing capabilities, OSAM capabilities, may be feasible. It's, it's not, and it really is a trade space. It's never a point answer. And the, and the, the, the complex and most important a variable in that trade space is time. Right, thinking forward about long-term plans and what you need to do now to plant the seed to enable capability so that you can have a viable on, on, uh, on surface presence. And some things make sense today and some things don't. So we'll see developments over time. Well, you know, you hit a, you hit a very important point. If you start back from the early days of servicing in 1972 or 1976, you always come to the issue is man servicing, human servicing, or robotic servicing. And in every mission I've ever come across, except for a few demonstration servicing on the, on the space station, it's always been a combination of humans and robotics, always working, beginning with Solar Max, it took a robot to capture the Solar Max. Uh, went all the way through with all of the other missions, and it took both robotic servicing and human servicing. And so we've always got to remember that if we're talking long-term, when we're talking Mars exploration and lunar exploration with humans, you've always got to have a robotic system and a human system that plays together. And that's a very important point you bring up. You can't go one and not the other. That is, that, that's, that's, um, that's not re reasonable. It just doesn't have that way. You always need both. Okay, great. Um, my next question is for Pamela. I want to talk about the biggest legal and regulatory challenges that exist right now in terms of, you know, helping the in-orbit servicing industry moving forward. I know that for a really long time, there was a big regulatory gap when it came to how to oversee uh, missions in orbit and doing specialized missions like satellite servicing in orbit. Is that still a problem for the industry? And what are the best ways to regulate this to make it so that there aren't any bad actors and also that the, the, the industry can flourish? Okay. I think from the um, industry's perspective, the satellite service operator's perspective, you would want uh, this 
flexible and as little regulation really as possible. And uh, what you have today is a pretty robust licensing regime for many of the functions, like the communications function, the sensing function. And at this stage, I don't think we need any additional regulations to be imposed. I, somebody there was earlier in the Q&A talked about uh, imposing a regulation, a requirement for a grappling uh, system on each satellite. Now, who would impose that requirement? The FCC typically hasn't imposed specific requirements. They have debris mitigation requirements, but those are more performance-based and for the most part is for the operator to decide how they want to achieve a certain goal. Um, so I don't think really that the regulation should be used for that at this stage. I don't think we're there yet. You could stifle technology if you impose regulations at too early a stage. So it's very important at this point that we don't have any uh, stifling regulatory initiatives, I think you would say. Maybe taking a, a guide from what's happening at the FAA space office for human spaceflight, where they're really allowing the industry to develop standards as opposed to imposing any legal requirements at this stage. In fact, it's, there's a moratorium on regulatory requirements on, cer on certain aspects of space uh, flight safety. You cannot regulate that today, except um, in certain narrow uh, circumstances for the FAA space office. So that's sort of a guide to how you want to do it. Let industry develop its standards, and then slowly, slowly, it may be appropriate to impose some performance-based regulations, but not, not at this point. Uh, one other point I wanted to address, and that was insurance was brought up here. Um, why would the insurer want to give a discount or for, for a, um, someone putting a grappling system on the satellite? What kind of insurance are we talking about? If we're talking property insurance in orbit. Uh, that means insurance if the satellite is damaged. Uh, who cares about the grappling system, right? if we're talking third party liability insurance, well, what you really want is those satellites to orbit in a, in a, in a orderly fashion uh, by being lowered by their own propulsion, I think, to a lower orbit so that they re-enter as opposed to being dragged down. So I, I don't know that that's the best tool for, for encouraging this industry. I think the industry has a lot of promise on its own uh, but we got to be really careful that we don't overregulate and that we don't look to insurance for unrealistic uh, assistance. So those are my those are my thoughts. To add on to that, oh, go ahead. Do I need to add on to that? Uh, Dr. Law is muted. <laughs> I'm muted. Oh, sorry. Try one more time. Oh, someone else is muted. We can't hear you. <laughs> um, can you oh, hear wait. me now? Yes. <laughs> okay. So I was I was talking about the connections between different space subsectors. So yes, maybe we, you know, Pam was talking about regulations in the, in the sort of the narrow niche of the servicing sector, but we could be talking about regulations for the, for the satellite sector, right? So to what extent, again, I'm not proposing any regulations or anything, but I'm posing a question, to what extent regulations to deorbit, to that, that there's a requirement that if you launch a satellite, you have to deorbit within X years. And again, no, I mean, I, I'm just, you know, floating the, the question about the connection between sectors. So the case for on-orbit servicing, let's say uh, deorbit services could be made if there's regulations on the satellite sector to deorbit their satellites once they're no longer functioning within you know, X years. And again, all of those are questions that are currently being 
being considered uh, and need to be considered. But it's a really important point to think about these connections within the space sector. I'd like to add one thing, Lauren, and, and it's a subtlety here that um, a, a couple of panelists have brought up. It, it's always ideal if a satellite works perfectly and has the right amount of fuel and does the disposal, end of life disposal perfectly. That is what we want, but perfect doesn't happen in space. And so the, what on of services provide is that certainty for those performance requirements and to ensure the safety, uh, uh, space flight safety in orbit. Um, satellites have anomalies. Satellites run into each other. Uh, debris runs into uh, operational satellites. Um, and so this is really um, a way to ensure that continuity of service, keep uh, the orbits clean, uh, have a logistical backbone to support the satellite and space ecosystem. And so uh, I agree that you know, a direct re-entry into atmosphere might be the best uh, way to go about this, but this is really about what happens if a group of satellites or one or two or more uh, fail in orbit. Great. All right, I have one final question because we're running out of time and this is for Brian, who we've talked about this quite a bit. So oftentimes when satellite servicing is covered in the press, People like to insinuate that the same technologies that are used to fix satellites can also be used to either destroy them or tamper with them. Also, this concept is kind of at the forefront of people's minds right now um, because the U.S. Space Command recently claimed that a Russian satellite tested out anti-satellite technology in orbit recently. So I'm wondering how founded are these fears that satellite servicing can go bad and what is the best way to ensure that satellite servicing technology is indeed used for helping broken satellites? Great question and one that comes up all the time. Um, first, I'll say it is true that at a theoretical level, a lot of the same technologies can be used uh, in a malicious manner, just like you can pull a, you know, a pencil or a pair of scissors out of your pocket and do bad things with them, even though they're not designed to be, designed to be weapons. Um, with that said, it is often a lot harder to use these technology capabilities in a malicious manner than what people propose. Uh, you know, the videos that are being shown of, you know, satellites coming together and docking are often very much sped up compared to the real life way it happens. It often happens much more slowly and much more deliberately than what you see. Uh, and, and, you know, there's a lot of these features of the servicing kit technologies just aren't things the military's looking to do. You're gonna see this thing coming from a long ways away. You're gonna have a lot of time to evaluate that it's a threat and respond. They're just not gonna be very effective weapons. All that said, it is really important to be able to discriminate between the commercial civil use of these technologies and the potential military applications of things like military RPOs and core orbital ASATs. So that's one something that Confers has been talking about. And we've been talking about practices and recommended things that commercial servicing can do to help increase the transparency of commercial activities and discriminate them from other things. Uh, the, the military is probably not going to be very open about what's going on. So that's sort of what we're talking about is, you know, sets of behaviors, information sharing, steps that companies can take to be more transparent about their commercial servicing activities that make it very clear that this is being done in a in a civil peaceful manner and is not part of some you know military covert program and to help keep those things separate wonderful um all right i'm going to give anybody a last minute chance to jump in before we have to wrap up i think we have a hard out at four but um yeah i think this was a great discussion any last thoughts from anyone well, for me, like, thank you, uh, Lauren, for moderating uh, this and giving, delivering great questions and, and to all the panelists. Thank you. Thank you for putting this on. I'm excited to hey. see what the future holds. Same here. No, on, I'll, I'll be right on it. <laughs> on, on that note, sorry for, for interrupting there. On, on that note, um, I, I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm still on campus here. I think that's appropriate because <laughs> I feel uh, quite a bit smarter now 
about on orbit services, both the possibilities and the challenges, and, and that's due to our incredible lineup of uh, virtual professors here. So thank you all so much. Lauren, excellent job moderating. I want to thank Secure World Foundation for co-hosting this great event with us, and of course, to everyone who attended for, for being attentive students. Um, look in your inboxes uh, for a survey to tell us how we did, and keep an eye out for future AstroScale US events. Thank you all so much. Have a great day.